I've said this before and I will say it again. Charity does not end poverty. Jobs do. It's all about the importance of access to resources. Resources give you freedom and flexibility for your life. Money gives you freedom and flexibility for your life. By having choices and having freedom and flexibility, that gives somebody dignity. Giving them a handout and doing something for them doesn't teach anything to them. It doesn't empower them. Now, I get it. Charity is important and we shouldn't discredit charity. However, the full solution to ending global poverty, I fully wholeheartedly believe in my heart of hearts, it's through the access to jobs. My guest today also has that passion and she pretty much wrote the book on it. Oh wait, she actually just did write a book on this very thing. And we're going to dive right into that topic because it's one that I think is really important. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of Still Being Molly, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, a CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just an incredible person who is trying to make a positive impact not only through their personal life, but also with their professional career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact right where you are. My guest this week is Jane Mossbacker Morris, the founder and CEO of To The Market and the author of the newly released book, Buy the Change You Want to See. To The Market connects consumers and businesses to ethically made products from around the world. Jane partners with companies like Freeset and Sari Bari, ethical businesses that offer a safe work environment for women who have been exploited in the sex trade or who are vulnerable to human trafficking. She previously served as the Director of Humanitarian Action for the McCain Institute for International Leadership. I love Jane. I have followed her work for years, and this conversation was one that I was so looking forward to, and I just had the best time, and I know that you're going to love it. So, now, on to my conversation with Jane. Jane, I really feel like we are basically longtime friends who have never actually met in person. I totally agree. <laughs> I'm like so, so excited to be chatting. Because I, do you ever really like come into contact with those people who you know them and they know you, but you've never had a conversation and it's almost like, you get together and you know all these things about each other, but then, but you realize that like you never told that person that thing or they never told you that thing. And then it almost feels like creepy and stalkerish, but then you're just both okay with it. <laughs> yes, totally. I mean, I, I sort of feel like that's a little bit story of my life, but <laughs> I, know. I know you're like, oh my God, I love Harry's birthday cake. And then you're like, wait. We've never met in person, but that's cool. I know. I know. Or like, I feel like if I ever see a celebrity in person, like if I ever meet a celebrity, that's how I am with celebrities where I'm just like, oh my gosh, remember that time that you did that thing and you were there and they're like, mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Slowly walk away. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, well, I have been j such a big fan of To The Market and you of yours for such a long time that I am really excited to hear your story from your mouth. Um, so does that sound weird? I don't know. No, um, thank so, you. That's so really kind of you. Yes. So um, we are going to dive right in and I'm going to have you give us the Jane 101. So tell us your story. Like, what is your why? Why do you do what you do? And what is your background? Yeah, well, um, first of all, I'm super pumped to be able to share. And um, I appreciate all the all the work that you're doing to highlight businesses and social entrepreneurs that are trying to make a difference in the world. So it's uh, super fun to to be amongst the the group that you get to talk to. No, oh, thanks. For me, um, I mean, I think, you know, my why is really around believing that every human being on this planet has something to contribute and has a purpose. And um, I personally feel really strongly about the dignity of work mm. and um, really came to that realization um, in a totally windy way. I started my career um, over a decade ago in the U.S. Department of State and was working actually in counterterrorism. So like completely different space than um, retail, which I'm now in, um, and really was working and traveling all over the world. And, and at this point in time, we were in the height of, you know, what we called the global war on terror. And I kept spending time with people who at the end of the day, fundamentally were looking for um, the ability to have more control over their destiny 
And so much of having control over your destiny while we're here on earth is really around um, having access to resources. Yeah. And when I say resources, um, it doesn't necessarily mean um, that you are like the breadwinner, um, but it means having access to either earn your own income um, to share an income with your family, yep. um, you know, your spouse or whatever it may be, or to inherit an income. Mm-hmm. So just to have access to resources and the, the resource access is important because ultimately it's what gives you the freedom and flexibility to make choices about your life. Yeah. So, you know, if I say, Hey, I want my daughter to stay in school for three more years. And, um, you know, my spouse or family feels like that's not a priority. If I have access to resources, I can be the sort of variable, um, additional, um, income that, that makes a difference to create the outcome for, um, you know, the daughter that I want to create. So I kept hearing that and felt ultimately, um, to make a long story short that, that the business world, the private sector, um, was the most effective and efficient way to create and sustain jobs. And, um, I felt like I could add, value and and helped cr- help create and protect the dignity of work for as many people as possible if i focused on connecting what i describe as sort of vulnerable communities overlooked communities which tend to be a lot of women um people living in parts of the world that have not had international market access specifically in the space of apparel accessories and home goods um, manufacturing and creation and yeah. really connecting these makers to um, consumers, to brands, and to retailers who are interested in buying and shopping differently. Yeah. Now, how did you get into this? Like, had you been a world traveler? Was, you know, were you somebody who always just kind of had wanderlust and you um, visited, you know, like, where where did this kind of spur from? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I've always been a big traveler. Um, so like totally loved traveling growing up and then obviously working for the state department was doing a ton of, of, um, like off the beaten path path type of travel. And, um, you know, after the state department, before I started to the market, the business, I worked for Cindy McCain and the McCain Institute for a couple of years as well. And that really continued, um, again, sort of, you know, unique travel opportunities, um, into the developing world, really focused on, um, meeting with people and understanding like what they needed, what they wanted, where there was opportunity, uh, to create value in, in the market. Yeah. And, really, it was a culmination of, of so many experiences. Again, everything from working on counterterrorism to um, fighting human trafficking um, at the McCain Institute. Yeah. Did you go to school for this? Or did this just sort of fall into your lap after college? So I did an undergraduate in at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Mm-hmm. So super focused on international affairs. And I focused specifically on national security for undergrad. And then I did an MBA at Columbia. So I have sort of like a mix of business for grad and then very like international relations for undergraduate. Yeah. Did you do you feel like that experience at Georgetown um, and then at Columbia? But I guess really, I I don't know. I mean, maybe it wasn't like this for you. But for me, I felt like my undergrad years, whereas, you know, I don't necessarily remember. I mean, I remember a few of my favorite classes, but I don't necessarily remember all of the content that I learned in my four years of undergrad. But I, I just remember like how much I changed as a human during those four years and like how much I changed through the connections that I made through the network that I created, um, how I created some of those lifelong friendships that like when I really trace back like where I am now and even the weird route that I took after college from being a high school teacher and like working for um, the governor of Virginia and like I've been I was a comedian like I've done all these kind of like weird things I love it and so so, you know I think back like it doesn't make sense but when I really trace back from where I am now um, I can trace everything back to the the decisions and the network that I made in college like 
if I had not gone to school where I went to school and made the friends that I had made and joined the sorority that I had joined, like if I had not done those things, like I, I don't think I would be where I am right now. So it's really interesting when I start to trace those things back. Um, do you feel like that that experience? Because I've always heard that, especially at schools like Georgetown, where like the community is so knit and it's almost like you can meet somebody else in another country that went to Georgetown and it's like you have this instant connection. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think Georgetown was super interesting for me because I was a little bit like socially checked out Mm. because by the time I got to DC, I was so ready to work Mm. that I very quickly moved into taking, you know, Georgetown's amazing at attracting adjunct professors who are doing these like weekly seminars. So you have class at night, like after the workday. And so what I was able to do pretty quickly was get myself into like full-time internship roles. Oh, wow. And then my senior year, I actually got hired by the state department and I was like working, like working in the state department, like not as an intern. Yeah. And so I think like part of me was not as ingrained in the social culture in Georgetown as I would have been if I had been like a cooler person than I am. I think you're cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But um, I, I was like I was a little bit like on on my own planet. I think when I think about threads that really put me on a path, I mean, for me, it's so like my family, my parents are such influences for me around, um, you know, my, my father has worked on economic development his entire life. And my mom has worked on issues related to women and girls her entire life. And I feel like my work is a combination of the two. And so I think like when I think of a common thread through the like bizarre path that I've taken, it feels like that that is like the biggest influence is just yeah. watching them both do the work that they've done. Yeah. So you had these jobs in the public sector and you realized the opportunity of the private sector for creating jobs and all these things. And you eventually created to the market, which uh, so when I started my ethical fashion directory in 2015, was it 2015 or was it 2014? I don't know. It's been a while when I started this directory and all it really was, was like I realized that there was no there was no comprehensive list or like any place on the Internet where you could easily find in one place places to shop that were ethical And so I was just like, I'm just going to throw together this list. And when I was putting together this list, I mean, at the time it started out, I had like 30 30 companies or 30 brands or something like that. Now it's like, I don't even know how long it is. Um, But To The Market was one of those first ones that I found like really early on. So I've just sort of followed you all these years and seen the work you do. So how did you get started with To The Market? Like, where did the idea come from? All those things. That's so fun. I love I love hearing that. Yeah, I mean, we you know, the vision was always to connect makers around the world who have been overlooked, who are vulnerable but so talented, so capable, so hungry with the purchasing power of you know, US consumers, US businesses and eventually, you know, more international consumers and businesses. The way that we started as we were building out our supply chain. So really building out relationships with suppliers around the world who fit our criteria of acting in a way that was employing people who are vulnerable, employing them in an ethical way, and also having an eye towards um, being environmentally sustainable. As we were building out that sort of supply chain, we set up a marketplace Mm -hmm. that allowed for these suppliers to begin selling to US-based consumers. Um, All the while, we were really developing relationships with them to understand their capacity, um, to understand the reliability, uh, quality, just a number of things to really get a sense for how capable each of our partners were at uh, fulfilling certain requests that maybe bigger buyers might have. And as that progressed and we got more comfortable and expanded our suppliers around the world, and now we're at like over 100 that we work with, um, we began to sell to 
um, retailers and brands. So we began to wholesale product that was being made by these suppliers um, so that it could become sort of a part of the normal mix that one might have within their business organization, you know, the the business card holders that they hand out to all employees, or mm-hmm. it could be um, retail facing. So it's the tote bags that, um, you know, you come into a store and shop from. Our vision was how do we shift the way that typical retail manufacturing is done, which is, you know, traditionally over the last several decades been through these long lead factories um, that I think, you know, have a lot of room for improvement on the environmental and social side towards a more syndicated supply chain model where you're tapping into the production capacity and the skill sets of these communities around the world who are so capable, who have been overlooked, um, but that are actually much better fits for what consumers want today. And so the business has really evolved towards now, you know, I would say the vast majority of the business that to the market does is with corporations, with brands and with retailers on custom manufacturing and sourcing, still using that same supply base. Yes, that is amazing. And you just have... I don't like to use the word amassed, but it's the only thing I can think of. You've just created this community in in connecting makers to the purchasing market. And anyway, I've just I've fallen in love with your shop over the years and I just love your mission and the heart behind it. Um, I mean, it's one of the reasons that I mean, I when I like I said, when I first came across you um, and I was just like, yes, she's doing exactly what I was looking for. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you. Now, there's a point that you actually said right at the beginning, and it is something that um, – so I am listening to audiobooks this year. I'm really into audiobooks right now, and I realize, like, maybe I'm 10 years – like late to the audiobook train. Um, But I love to read and I just haven't had as much time to read in the last few years. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to get on the audiobook train. Um, And I've been listening to, um, I'm currently listening to um, Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. Um, And Trevor Noah is just hilarious. He's really funny. But one of the, he, he just said this little point today and it was a part of a bigger story of like when he was in high school and he was finding ways to earn money. Um, But it was this one point that really resonated. And I was like, man, this can be applied in so many ways. And so you were talking about the importance of access to resources and how it gives you freedom and flexibility. Um, And he was talking about money and how money is one of those things where you don't necessarily like money gives you choices, And so you want more money so that you can have more choices. It's not even necessarily about the amount. And it's like it sort of goes back to that whole notion or idea of like when you see somebody who becomes an instant millionaire and then they end up being bankrupt because they get too much money and then all of a sudden they have too many choices and then they just blow it all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. And then um, but it was I love that point that he made about like it's not about the amount of money. It's about the choices you can make with that money. Um, and that just reminded me of what you were saying or what what you said reminded me of that notion of like, it's, you know, so often, and I have feel like I have this conversation over and over and again, but I feel like it's one that can continue, can, we should continue to have because it's so important. Um, and it, it really, emphasizes the vital role that jobs are, especially when we are talking about the developing world, um, is that these these amazing men and women and um, don't want charity. They want opportunity. They want access to resources. They want money so that they can make their own choices for their family. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. I mean, I... I obviously know that aid plays a really important role in global development without question. But once people's basic needs are met, people really prefer to have the ability to earn um, their and have choice rather than um, be given. And usually when you're given, you don't have choice, Mm -hmm. meaning that, If I am being offered shelter, um, 
you know, I'm not in a position to say, gosh, this shelter is really not in a convenient neighborhood for me. Or if I'm being, you know, given food, I'm not really able to say, oh, I'm really sick of eating rice. Like, what else do we have? Um, I, I, you know, I think, again, basic needs have to be met, no question. And there's an important role for aid. But Mm -hmm. beyond that, uh, it's, it's very rare to me that I haven't engaged with people that don't want to have the ability to earn their own income so that they can make the choices that I certainly take for granted every day. What do I want to eat? Where do I want um, to live? Um, Do I want to continue, you know, basic education, things like that? Yeah. Now, since you started to the market, um, obviously, you got this idea for connecting these makers to the consumer market. Um, Since you started it, what has been the biggest lesson you've learned? I think, you know, everything takes time um, and often, you know, a lot more time than you want or think it will take. I think, um, you know, for us, we have learned um, a lot about how quickly people are willing to change their buying habits um, in reality versus what they say they will do. Yeah. Meaning that there has been, I think, for a while, a lot of talk about wanting to um, buy more socially responsible products. But I think it really does take behavioral change. And behavioral change takes time for people to actually do what they say that they want to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there have been clients that we have known and, um, you know, had a relationship with that have sort of circled around working for us, you know, for a year or two in some cases that suddenly like this little light bulb goes off and they become they just realize that it's um, something clicks for them that, you know, it's not as hard as they thought to make this shift. It's not as expensive or more expensive necessarily to source ethically than it is to source, um, you know, through conventional manufacturing. And um, for us, I think, you know, persistence has been such an important part of that process. I mean, I um, will bug the heck out of people Um, to stay in front of them, Um, much, you know, to the chagrin of um, the people on the other end. But I mean, I'm so grateful that like, I was given a persistent soul because like, I will just stay in front of people until they tell me to go away. And I'm like, so delighted when they tell me to go away, because then I know, at least I'm like, have heard some sort of feedback um, from them and it gives me the opportunity to then move on rather than just trying to stay in front of them. So I would say biggest lesson is um, things take time. Persistence is critical. Yes. Oh, yes. I was just having this conversation in a group, a Facebook group that I'm in with other content creators. Um, So it's bloggers and writers and podcasters and just various content creators. And I see posts like this all the time but this one post in particular um uh, a, a content creator was just talking about how she wanted to just throw in the towel and she was just ready to quit and she was so done and um she just felt like she was gonna never make it and um you know, a lot of us just tried to jump in and encourage her because we have all had those days. It's like entrepreneurship, the roller coaster of entrepreneurship, where you're just like, this is great. I want to quit. Um, I love this job and I never want to see another person again. Like you just like that's it's that up and down, up and down, up and down. And we all just kind of jumped in and we were like, no, 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 no. Don't quit. Like if you really love it and you are really passionate about it, like it's going to take time to grow. Um, and I talked about how I was like, I've been a blogger for 11 and a half years and I didn't make money till I was six years in so you know I did it for so long never earning a dime because I just loved it and I care I, I cared about what I was writing and I cared about what the community I was building and then I realized I could do it for a business but even then like it took time once I started monetizing it to realize you know, how to grow it. And same with the podcast. Like when I first started the podcast, I mean, I just contacted the people I knew. And then, you know, now here we are like a hundred, I don't even know, like 30 episodes in and, 
you know, it, it's taken time to grow. Like it's not an overnight thing. And so, so often you see those, oh, that person was an overnight success, yet you don't see the 10 years of work that went into building up whatever is so-called a overnight success, you know? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's like a great visual that I have somewhere on my phone where it shows essentially in like an iceberg and you see the top of the iceberg oh, yes. over the water. Yeah. And the rest of it's under and it's like you're just seeing that top piece, but you don't see all the time it took to climb up, you know, to get to that point. I mean, gosh, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there is, um, you know, so much of, of everyone's work is a culmination of like a lifetime of resources and contacts and, um, effort that, that you're putting into things. And, um, persistence is, is, is critical. I mean, it's probably the most important characteristic I can think of in, in, on entrepreneurship. Yep. Amen to that. Now, you have had something really exciting happen here in the last couple of months. You wrote a book, which is amazing. And I have so many friends who are authors. And so I always just like want to give you a standing ovation, like round of applause just for actually doing it. Because there's so many people that are like, I've always wanted to write a book or like they don't realize like the amount of time and effort. And like, it's basically birthing a like a work baby. So by the change you want to see, it came out at the end of January and this is just amazing. So talk to us about the book. Thank you. It is. I'm so excited. This is um, definitely a reflection of the philosophy behind the business. The idea that all of us have purchasing power that if we really think critically about and really harness has the power to positively impact other people and the planet. And what's exciting about the book is that it is super accessible and it uh, it really allows for readers to take a topic that they feel like works for them. So it could be coffee could be chocolate. It could be mass produced apparel and shoes. It could be gifts that give back and really think about, gosh, like I'm buying, you know, X number of pounds of coffee a year. If I commit to shifting to buying direct trade or fair trade coffee, I'm now learning about the impact that I can have on communities who are participating in this type of trade. And so it just sheds light on different categories, on different hacks um, as to how we can literally take the money that we spend every day and put it towards um, making a difference in the world without like making major changes in our life and without necessarily spending any more than we already are. Yes. Yes. You know, I use the term all the time and I did not come up with it, but I just talk about it all the time is purchasing with purpose. And I even started a Facebook group um, called for purchase with purpose um, so that people could have these conversations. And um, I don't know who originally said the quote. Um, I know I have it written down somewhere, but um, it's that you vote every single day by the way you spend your money. And you know, we live in a very highly politicized culture and people are always saying, you know, oh, go vote, 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 vote. And I'm like, that's awesome. You should go vote. Um, But you also vote every single day by the way you spend your money, by the companies you support. And I always kind of give this analogy. I'm like, yes, Target. I do. I do love Target. I am a red blooded American woman, um, and I love Target. Um, but uh, when I make a purchase at Target, that purchase doesn't impact Target. Like they don't. Whether if I stop purchasing from Target, they m- are not going to miss me. Um, and if I go shopping for my Christmas presents at Target, you know, it's a blip on their radar. But if I go and I purchase my gifts from to the market, or if I go and I buy a shirt from Elegantese, or if I buy a pair of boots from the Root Collective, those purchases are felt immediately. They are able to make direct hiring decisions because of my purchase. And it sounds so silly to be able to say like, oh, well, my one purchase like did good. Um, I have a friend who owns um, a 
company here in Raleigh called Design for Joy. And she talks about how like one pair of earrings provides three hours of employment for a woman overcoming um, abuse situations, a woman overcoming human trafficking, a woman over, you know, who has just been released from prison, a woman who is working her way up to start a new life for herself who needs a second chance um, and has just been given the opportunity of a job. Um, That one pair of earrings provides three hours of work for her. Now imagine how many hours you know, you can provide by buying two air, two pairs, three pairs, five pairs. And when it adds up, like it makes a difference and people just don't realize that. Totally. I mean, you think about, I mean, this world and the market, like the markets that exist at a local level, at a regional level, at an international level, they almost all started as like family owned or small mom and pop shops or brands. And you know, for mom and pop shops and brands that still exist today, it truly exists based on the loyalty of a handful of customers that decide that they want to frequent that establishment or that brand. I mean, I can absolutely say that the vast majority of businesses, you know, in the United States, most of which are small and medium sized businesses, they do look at at their sales, like on a weekly basis, and sometimes on a daily basis. And so even deciding that, okay, I'm going to spend 10% of the money that I spent on gifts over the course of 2019, with small businesses or local businesses, that in itself can make a big difference, because it really is a domino effect, where if you are able to, you know, make a small commitment to spend money in a way that, um, you know, you believe in, in supporting, let's say, you know, local businesses in your area, um, that does all of the things you just described that allows them to grow, that amount allows them to make additional hires, um, that allows them to, you know, realize their dreams of having this business, you know, work and thrive, um, in a way that is really significant. Yeah, absolutely. And it is something that I've, I love when I have somebody come up back up to me and say, you know what, I changed my purchasing habits in this area. And I now love that when somebody stops me and asks me about this particular item or this particular company, I can then tell them about the story behind it. You know, it's just, it just makes it so much more personal and we realize the direct impact that we are having. So, um, I'm so excited about the book. Um, I have already read it. It's incredible. And I just can't wait for it to, I mean, I can't wait to hear the impact that it it continues to have um, on so many people as it gets into the hands of other people. So um, for those listening, if you do not already have it, because it did come out at the end of January, but if you did not already have a copy, you can grab it on Amazon, um, read it. You'll love it. It's a real quick, easy read. um, And it's just, it's so impactful. And I just love the way that you give so many tangible um, examples and takeaways and that it's not just kind of all like, doom and gloom. (laughs) Does that make sense? (laughs) Totally. No. And we wanted to be like so positive because there's so many amazing things that are happening, both, you know, small businesses and big businesses that are trying really hard to make a positive impact and make it easier and more accessible from a price standpoint for all of us to participate. And so, yeah, I mean, the book is all about micro changes. Yes. Amen to that. Um, well, we are going to transition a little bit to my one of my favorite portions of the show. Not that I don't love just talking about all these things, but I also just love asking some fun get to know you questions just to, you know, learn a little bit more about Jane, the person and not just Jane, the entrepreneur. So uh, this is also the portion of the show that my listeners know where my executive producer husband um, inserts some sort of like sound effect or movie clip to transition (laughs) us. So you never know what it's going to be. It's going to be a surprise every single week. So uh, Jane, are you ready? I'm totally ready. I had an idea like that once, a long time ago. Really? What was it, Tom? Well, all right. It was a jump to conclusions mat. You see, it would be this mat that you would put on the floor and would have different conclusions written on it that you could jump to. 
That is the worst idea I've ever heard in my life, Tom. Yes. Yes, it's horrible, this idea. What is your go-to song at a karaoke night? Oh, man, karaoke is so fun. <laughs> you know, I um, if I'm with girls, I, I like love a good Indigo Girls oh, song. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, like we could do Closer to Fine. <laughs> like that's like a crowd pleaser. Um, oh, my gosh. I recently was at um, – this like business accelerator and was surrounded with a bunch of um, male CEOs that like became brothers. And so I did quite a lot of um, Sunny and Cher so we could do duets. <laughs> so I got you, babe. is like also a pretty good one. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's amazing. That's amazing. It is sort of amazing. I love it. Well, that um, leads me to my next question, which is what just makes you laugh the most? Like to the point that you're just, your stomach hurts, your face hurts, everything hurts because you're laughing so hard. I'm pretty obsessed with the Golden Girls. Yes. So I who mean, doesn't I... love the Golden Girls? Yes. So it is what I watch literally every night before I fall asleep oh my God, because it lets me completely turn my mind off. It's like the the storylines never relate to like my life um, generally. And so it doesn't like remind me of every, anything. Wait, you're not in your 80s? Are you not I in know, your 80s? I, I know. You were. Although no, actually my nickname at Georgetown was Grandma. <laughs> but besides that, generally, no relation. Oh, um, that's amazing. So I would say, yes, Golden Girls, like as much as possible, Um it just, yeah, brings me like complete and total joy. That's amazing. Um, okay. So next question is, what was your favorite TV show to watch growing up? Simpsons. Oh, really? Loved. Oh, my God. Totally. That's hilarious. Yeah. I was not we allowed to watch The Simpsons. That, like introduced us to it. <laughs> my parents were like not happy about it at all. I know really strict like tv rules and we could only watch like 30 minutes a night That's so funny. Um, but then they watched it and they thought it was really funny so now my two siblings and we're all super close and all like super weird we all know like all of the simpsons episodes and so like i feel like half of the conversations we have are lines from like simpsons episodes that's hilarious. I was not allowed to watch The Simpsons because I also had strict TV watching rules. And so I would like sneak over. I was also not a watch, allowed to watch The Power Rangers. And so I had to like. That's amazing. I had to and sne- probably a blessing. <laughs> and I had to sneak over to friends' houses to watch The Simpsons and Power Rangers. It's so funny. I know. <laughs> I, I was it. like, it's so funny because I remember back at the time being like, oh, mom, why? Like, why can't I watch that? And now, like, my own kids, you know, they'll ask. I mean, they're only five and two, but, well, Amos is three. Gosh. Um, oh, my gosh. Did he really just turn to the, oh, I don't even know. My life. Um, <laughs> they're five and three. And, you know, they'll ask to watch a particular show. And I'm like, no. Like, they'll see a commercial for some show. And they're like, can we watch that? I'm like, No. Um, so, I mean, like the other day, like Amos really loves Spider-Man. He's all into Spider-Man and I don't really know even where he learned about Spider-Man, but he's all into Spider-Man. And so I saw that there was like a kid's animated Spider-Man on the Disney channel. So I was like, okay, we can check out this like episode of the Spider-Man. I was like a minute in and I was like, you are not watching this show. It's too violent. Really? Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so It really funny. is not that bad. But I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, I am my mother. Like I am I my love mother. that so much. Yeah. Power Rangers is actually like, if you watch the original, it's like so bad, it's good. Oh, like I think that yes. the budget per episode was probably like $50. Oh, yes. So you see like, you see the like special effects and it's just, it's just so um, good. It's oh so gosh. good. Yeah. It's so good. Um, it's so good. <laughs> okay. And my last question that I love to ask all of my guests is, what are you most grateful for today? You know, I have like the best husband on the planet. Aww. Um, Yeah. No, I'm, I'm like so, 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 so fortunate that uh, my husband literally makes me laugh every single day. He is so funny. Um, he has such a quirky sense of humor. Um, and I just, I'm so like grateful that I laugh before he leaves in the morning. And when he comes back at night, I mean, I'm just 
how lucky am I to be married to my best friend? Oh, that's awesome. I also am married to my best friend and he edits this show. And so, hey, babe, I love you. You're the best. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Jane, this has just been such a pleasure and so great to finally chat. And now we can like say that we're actually friends like real life Thank friends you. Now. So <laughs> next step meeting in person <laughs> I know I know and congratulations again on the release of By the Change um, you want to see it is just wonderful and congratulations you just work so hard and so you deserve all of the applause and um, I just love the work that you do and so just thank you again so much thanks Molly Gosh, this episode was just full of so many things that I just want to scream from the rooftops. But one of the things that she said is when you've been given, you don't have a choice. When you earn, you have a choice. And that thing just keeps resonating with me over and over and over again. I would love to know what you loved about this episode or maybe something that you learned, something that occurred to you. Whatever it is, let me know on social media. You can find me at Still Being Molly or at Business With Purpose Podcast on Instagram or Facebook. And don't forget that hashtag Business With Purpose Podcast. And be sure to share the show with a friend. Sharing the show with a friend is the biggest way that you can support me. I get all the questions all the time is how can I support you and how can I encourage you? And my answer is share the show with a friend. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you are a first time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring incredible entrepreneurs who are changing the world with their businesses. And if you're one of my regulars, thank you so much for tuning in week in and week out. And thank you for your support. Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Radio Public, Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure you are subscribed to the show. Clicking that subscribe button helps to make sure that you never miss a new episode of the podcast. And while you're there, would you mind taking a moment to leave a review? Leaving a review of the show helps me to know what you're liking and how the show is personally impacting you. This show is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman. Support from Mark Haywood. And the music is by Mark Killian of Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose. Purpose.